teach God to us, that means that you kind of need to stop talking and listen. <laughs> Excuse me, man. <laughs> we need to make sure, because we're all Toastmasters and Toastmaster guests, so we need to make sure we get this all straight so that nobody goes home and says that Toastmasters don't know how to be an appropriate audience. Audience is, you know, the most important part of the speech, so thank you very much. We accept a round of applause for <laughs> Determination, anticipation, resistance, and endurance. Everybody thought only the big animals could pull this off. But they have all failed. But little clever deer was determined that he could do it, even if no one believes him. And 
therefore, he fixed his PS7 fiber over time. And when he told everyone he could do it, they said, no, you can't even do it. Look how small you are, how little your legs are. And he said, just give me a chance. Fellow Toastmasters, what have you dared to do in your life? And how many people have proved you wrong that you can't do this? Because of other reasons. At some point, you yourself have to decide. Make that determination. You have to know and anticipate that yes, I will succeed. You start to dream about succeeding. Reach it to the top of that mountain. In the process, you have to anticipate and then resist all the naysayers or whatever little voice is doubting in your mind that I can do this, I can pull this off. In the end, endurance is the mantra. You have to stick to it. You have to have that resilience. And so Clever Deer was climbing the mountain one step at a time. <clears throat> and he pulled his rope, sent it up one cliff, and kept going. <clears throat> this was the venture that the big elephants could not pull up. They had doubt to him. And when he got to the mountain, he offered a sacrifice to the gods, and it begins to rain on the kingdom. And prosperity rained down. Almost 13 years ago, I came in the U.S. as a refugee from Liberia. And I decided one of the things I really want to do is to get an education. Even folks in my own community were saying, you really cannot do it. Just find a job and work. And that's how it is done in this country. I said, I just don't want to work. I really want to go to school. After 10 plus years of running to survive, I said, this is my chance. And in my head, I decided, I determined to succeed. Every time I dream of me walking on stage, receiving a diploma, and I resisted all those who said, just forget about school, get a job and work. In the process, it took a lot of endurance. College was tough, to be frank. There were a lot of work. I have been out of school for many years, just running around to survive, like I said. And then I'm stepping into the doors of education. But that's what matters. You have to stick to it. There's always the ups and the downs. Little clever deer went up the mountain even when Everybody thought he wouldn't. You are here tonight. You could have been somewhere watching TV. Today's opening day, right? You could be somewhere watching the games. But what brought you here tonight? What about other projects, other texts, and dreams you have in your lives? Big or small. And sometimes those inner voices tell you, just not time yet, or you just can't do it. But you're always looking forward, anticipating that, yes, you will do it. <coughs> and you are resisting. Even in your Toastmaster journey, you are constantly resisting the odds that, yes, I can get my CC this year even if no one believes that you can do it. Therefore, I say, dare to succeed. You have to have that determination. You have to decide. No one else can do it for you. No one could have done it for me. You have to anticipate that yes, you were succeed. Positively, but also practically, that you were succeed. 
You have to resist everyone who would doubt you, even your own inner little voice. And finally, you have to endure. Endurance is the word. You have to have that resiliency. And at the end, you will climb that mountain of success, just like the little Claudia did. Dare to succeed. Madam Joseph. Contestant number two, Deb Martin. Courage to change. Courage to change, Deb Martin. to do and I didn't know what to do. And there are many people like us in the United States, about 12 million alcoholics at this time. Where to turn? Luckily for me, I found out about Al-Anon. Al-Anon is a 12-step program for families of alcoholics and also for their friends. So I went to my first meeting the week that my son started kindergarten. It was in the basement of the Methodist Church in our town. There was a group of people sitting around the tables drinking coffee, and they invited me to join them. So I did. 
I have no idea what was said at that meeting, except at the end, when they said to me, you need to come back at least three times before you decide. Come back? Me? He had the problem. I'm too busy for this. I worked full time, had two small children. I don't have time for meetings. But I wanted what they had. These people had some serious problems. And yet some of the time, they were laughing. I almost never laughed. So I went back for 25 years. The people in the program gave me courage. The 12 steps gave me a pro process of how to change. Now I had a process and I had support group. I had hope. My family could be saved. I also discovered a toolbox of slogans Slogans such as, easy does it, one day at a time, how important is it? Don't get me wrong, Al-Anon did not take away all of my problems, but now I have tools to work through them and people to help me. Could you use any of these slogans in your life? Or do you know someone who might be looking for help? There are various 12-step programs and for many different kinds of isms. For me, sticking with the program, I became a sponsor to some other people who were new and I learned and grew from what they did. I first had to start with step one. And step one was admitting that I needed to change my thinking. Instead of focusing on what I could not control, I needed to change to what I could control, which was me. By changing my focus of control, I needed help with that too. So I said the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Now I had a little more courage to keep on changing. But don't get me wrong, I didn't change overnight. I took a few steps forward, and I took a few steps back. But the people in the program were patient and understanding. I asked my sponsor, Karen, once, why didn't I know what to do? I'm a smart person. And she said, alcoholism is like the elephant in the room. We ignore it, and we <clears throat> deny that it's there. I was good at ignoring. I was weighed down by guilt and garbage thinking until I took step four, which is a, taking a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself, followed by step five, when I admitted to God, myself, and my sponsor, Karen, all of my wrongs. The relief and the release that I felt was beautiful. All of my time in Al-Anon has given me some great insights into understanding that my husband did love me, but the drug of alcohol had control of his life until he joined Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. I stand before you today a stronger, happier person because of al -Anon. The 12 steps are simple, but they're not easy. With the support group of the people in the meetings and the slogans, they were keys to saving me and my family. Take courage. Change is possible. Madam Tosman. <laughs>
Vasilev. The Sound of Service. The Sound of Service, Prez Vasilev. <laughs> and guests, in your life's quest for joy, you hear many voices, many words, many sounds. But come back with me to the summer of 2005, when in St. Cloud, Minnesota, I heard the most important sound of all. I arrived to sell children's books, door to door, and I thought, I have everything I need to succeed. Passion, persistence, and a sexy accent. <laughs> <laughs> Ding dong, not interested. Slam. Ding dong, get out of here. Slam. Ding dong, go back to your country. Slam. Rudeness, ridicule. Rejection. I asked myself a profound question. Why am I doing this job? <laughs> I can't make a single sale. Little did I know that I was one door away from a profound answer. No bell rang. A distant bark got louder and a middle-aged man with brown curly hair stood before me. Down at his feet was a small, white, fluffy dog barking, wagging its tail. Perhaps that dog was saying, we are not interested. <laughs> <coughs> he was silent. He glanced at my back. I took out a book. I walked into a narrow corridor, a strange place. Blinking lights, smoke alarms, mysterious machines. We entered the small living room, and on the sofa was a little girl with brown curly hair reading a book. I said, hey. She kept reading. <laughs> he touched her shoulder. She looked up smart, stood up. The blinking lights, the smoke alarms, the sound. They are dead. No TV, no PC, no radio. I could only hear our footsteps and occasional barks of the small fluffy ball. <laughs> I noticed how the man patted it gently. That dog woke him up every morning. That dog alerted him that I was at the door. That dog was his ears. I wrote down, is the mom here? We sat down at the sofa. I took out a sample of the low-priced books, and I let my body speak. <laughs> <laughs> Their faces light up. Fifty dollars. He looked at her, took out his checkbook, and placed the order. I thought, it's a beautiful life, oh, it's a beautiful life, oh. <laughs> the name on the check, Mr. Rodney Jones. I took out a sample of the expensive books. <laughs> Their eyes got big, $300. As I handed him the note, she gave him a pleading look. I gave him a pleading look. <laughs> he put his checkbook away, and her smile vanished. I'll deliver your books at the end of the summer. Before we parted ways, I wrote down, what's her name? He wrote down, Hope. And he gestured. 
You know what he was saying? Thank you. I left that house, and the street sounds silenced the barks of the small dog. But I never forgot the big role it played in that family. You see, everything in its life revolved around the sounds of service. The doorbell, a sound of service. The alarm clock, a sound of service. The smoke alarm, a sound of service. Before that quiet house, I could hear rudeness, ridicule, rejection, but I was deaf to the sound of service. Yet after that house, every time they said, not interested, I heard, keep going. <laughs> Someone down the street is interested. Every time they said, get out of here, I heard, hurry up. Someone is waiting to tell you, get in here. Every time they said, go back to your country, I heard. Go back to your country! <laughs> <laughs> but it's not what they say. It's what you hear. When you listen to the sound of service in your life, doors will open. I entered many homes, sold many books, and discovered that real joy, lasting joy, comes not when you get, but when you give. At the end of the song, I was making deliveries, and I arrived at the same quiet house to see the smile of little Hope opening her new books. I took out a packet of the expensive books, wrote down a gift for you, and gave it to her. Mr. Jones's reaction, <laughs> my reaction. Contestant number four, Sabil Ahmed. Take what you got. Take what you got, Sabil Ahmed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, were you ever conscious ever of your weight, your height, or any one of your body features. Please raise your hands. Wow, so many of you. Are you throwing an April Fool's joke on me? <laughs> <laughs> Hope not. Ma'am Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, esteemed guests, and especially the good-looking judges out here. <laughs> As a 10-year-old boy growing up in India, I was very short, four feet short, and 50 pounds thin. 
And I used to be very, very conscious of my height, my weight, and especially my nose. <laughs> I used to go every day to my class with a heavy backpack, and I used to sit down, and I used to stare. And I used to stare at this boy who used to be the chubbiest boy in the whole world. <laughs> and I used to pray to God that, oh God, why did you make me so thin? Why did you make me like him? And I used to feel very depressed. The next few days, I used to go and look at some other kid who used to be taller than me, stronger than me, and faster than me. And I became very, very depressed. I used to look myself into the mirror. My nose, it's like a potato. <laughs> and my ears, my ears. If Darwin would have came back, he would have said, ladies and gentlemen, now we finally have the proof that human beings, they were evolved from elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and my height four feet short. I thought I just came out from the set of, honey, I shrunk the kids. <laughs> All of my consciousness of my body made me very, very depressed. I stopped playing with my friends. My grades they used to be A plus. They went down, C minus. I started to retreat in my room, in my own shell. Looking at that condition, my parents they became very, very concerned, just like the parents who are here when they look at when you are worried about your kids. They became very concerned. They came inside my room, and they said. Sabine, with my father's hand on my shoulder. Sabine, we know that it's a wonderful day and you're staying inside your room. Look at your grades. How can we help you? Mom, Dad, I don't want to go to school anymore. Everyone is better than me. They're stronger than me. I don't want to go to school anymore. My father, with a big smile, he said, my son, Sabil, every one of your schoolmates, your classmates, they have shortcomings. But count the blessings that God has given you. You have a wonderful mind. You have a wonderful family. Count your blessings and take what you got and make this world a better place, Sabil. Listening to that advice, Sabil, <coughs> He had a profound change. Everyone has shortcomings like I do. Wow, I stepped outside the shell. And now I looked inside the mirror. The mirror is not too small for me because now I'm a six foot tall Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> my ears, they're perfect now. And my nose, as perfect as Michael, jo Michael Jackson. <laughs> That fall, I went back to school, fully charged, took the best classes out there, studied my heart out, came in first in the school. Took up sports, took up running, and took up table tennis. Anyone likes table tennis? <laughs> yes, good, good. <laughs> I came in first in the class. So I was fully charged, and many, many years passed by. I came to the United States of America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, and the place of the tall. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the typical American male, I started to feel like the Sabine of the 10 year old again. <laughs> but I remember my father's advice, Sabine, take what you got, enjoy your shortcomings. Got married. Me and my wife, we went to Macy's to get a jacket for myself. I tried on one jacket, a second jacket, a third jacket. My wife looked at me and she said, Honey, are you buying it for yourself or for your dad? <laughs> They're too big on you, Sabil. We looked at the price tag, $300. No, I cannot afford $300. Became very frustrated. Went to the store clerk. Can you please help? I'm looking for a jacket. Sure, we could help you. 
take the elevator around the corner and go downstairs and you are going to walk straight and you will find some jackets and they're going to fit you. I said, wow, wonderful lady, she's going to help me with the jackets. We went downstairs to the elevator and the doors opened up the elevator and I could hear the music. I love you, you love me, you love me. Honey, where are we? Where are we? Hello Kitty section was there. The Bob section was there. The kids were running around. I wanted to go back, but my wife, she pulled me. She gave me a jacket, perfect fit. $89, Yahoo! I said $200. My father's advice came to my mind. Enjoy your shortcomings, take what you got. My fellow Toastmasters, ladies and gentlemen, just like Sabil, the 10 year old Sabil, who was wholly conscious of his height and weight, some of you may be conscious. Perhaps your weight, perhaps your health, perhaps your family, but do realize that with every shortcoming that you think that you have, there are countless blessings that God has given you. Take the skills that God has given you. Take all the wonderful blessings that God has given you. Lift up those people who are down and under and make this world a better place. And my dear uh, fellow Toastmasters, if life gives you lemons, what do you make? Lemonade. If life gives you potatoes, what do you make? <laughs> French fries. <laughs> Take what you got. Madam Toastmaster. Contestant number five, Rebecca James. A world of opportunity. A world of opportunity, Rebecca James. It was a warm summer evening in Saint-Malo, France. I was 16. He was Spanish and didn't speak any English. I spoke no Spanish. I giggled and he leaned in close to me, an inch away, so close to my lips. He planted a kiss on my cheek. Just peace, a typical French way of saying hello. If only I'd leaned in closer, it could have been so much more. That evening was the World Fair in Saint-Malo. There was tons of great food and music and dancing. I met people from Spain, Ireland, Turkey, South Africa, the list goes on. More than anything, that evening opened my eyes to the many different cultures in our world. It was a truly life-changing event for a 16-year-old girl, all on her own, so far from home. Madam Toastmaster, Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, that is the power of study abroad. The Institute of International Education reported that nearly 274,000 U.S. students studied abroad in the 2010-2011 academic year. 274,000, 
That sounds like a lot. It's actually only 1.4% of US students enrolled in higher education. 1.4%? We can do better than that. There are so many benefits to studying abroad. I'd like to share with you the three areas in which I personally grew through study abroad. Language skills, cultural exposure, and self-awareness. My first study abroad was that trip to France when I was 16. Upon my return, I no longer claimed that I could speak some French because I had truly become conversationally fluent. Après tout, l'immersion c'est la meilleure façon d'apprendre une autre langue. Comprenez-vous? Studies have shown time and time again, immersion is the best way to learn another language. Students studying in another country are forced to learn vocabulary that gets them through everyday life. And they experience better retention due to frequent use. Increased language skills are probably the most obvious benefit of studying abroad. Another benefit is cultural exposure. My second study abroad was a two-week program in China when I was in college. One vivid cultural memory from that trip was when a Chinese student and I were walking to class and we passed by a kindergarten. There was a yard full of 50 or so little Chinese boys and girls in matching uniforms playing various games. And I made a comment about how adorable these little kids were. And my friend asked me, how many kids do you want to have when you get older? Well, I just babbled on about how I love kids and how I'd really love to have a boy and a girl. But if I had two of the same, I would go for a third. But if I had three of the same, I would stop because just four is too many. And then I asked him to answer the same question. There was a long pause before he answered. And in that pause, I realized that I knew his answer would probably be one. You see, Chinese citizens are encouraged to have only one child per family in order to help cap the population growth and heavy taxes are placed on those who do not comply. What a stark cultural difference between the US and China. It was due to another starkly different cultural norm that I grew in the third area, self-awareness, during my final study abroad in Greece. In the US, when a start time is given for a meeting, the meeting generally starts at that time. <laughs> This is not always the case in Greece. The Greeks are a bit more laid back about timetables. While there, I was paired with Greek students to provide a community organization with free engineering work. And we were happy to give the work for free because this organization did such wonderful things for those in need. But you can imagine my frustration when meetings were continually started late or completely rescheduled without notice and without apology. This was culturally acceptable. But this frustration turned out to be a blessing in disguise. The Greek students forced me to go explore the city, to chat over coffee at the cafe, and to check out the beach. When I returned to the United States, I had a new appreciation for work-life balance. <laughs> and that's a skill that I've carried with me since. My three study abroad experiences were absolutely priceless. All lasted for 30 days or less. And it was because of that short time period that I was able to fit them between normal semesters in the US and summer work opportunities. These short-term experiences are becoming more and more popular. 58% of the students who studied abroad in 2010-2011 did so for eight weeks or less. And businesses love to see international experience on resumes. They know the skills gained from these opportunities are unparalleled. For me, the largest areas of growth were language skills, cultural exposure, and self-awareness. And I have been asked to recount my experiences in every job interview since then. In the past two years, my job responsibilities have included working with many people outside of the United States. And I am confident that my study abroad experiences have helped to get me to where I am. 1.4%. It's not enough. I hope that you will encourage the children in your lives to consider study abroad. They will not regret it. Mark Twain famously said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones that you did do.
Looking back, I am disappointed that I didn't lean into that almost kiss when I was 16. But I am most definitely not disappointed with my decision to study abroad. Madam Toastmaster. Contestant number six, Chuck Gerhardt, Our Angel Story. Our Angel Story, Chuck Gerhardt. Susan and I have been married for nine months. Life is good. Life is really good, except for the fact that the doctor just came in and told me I've got cancer. Not just any old cancer. Chuck, you've got stage 3 C melanoma. Although we didn't know it at the time, my five-year survival rate was a whopping 15%. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, and angels. It's a long story, but I was treated at Stanford University. And the day we went there to meet with the tumor board, at the end of that day I got sent to go get my first chest x-ray. So we go in, and I get my gown on, you know the gown, you know those really fashionable gowns that you get. I get it on, and we go in, and we sit down. In the waiting room, there's nobody in there. My wife, Susan, and I. And we are scared to death. No idea what's ahead of us. As we're sitting there, an older gentleman comes walking in from the right. And the other day, we wouldn't have noticed him. He's wearing a Black Raiders t-shirt. He's got bells around his wrist, like Santa Claus bells. We are in California, so it really shouldn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he goes in and he gets his fashionable little gown on, and he comes in and he sits down right next to me. All kinds of open chairs, he sits right next to me. And he goes, so where are you at in the process? Well, just got started. We just met with the tumor board. I'm here for my first chest x-ray. Oh, I'm here for my last chest x-ray. I have esophageal cancer, or they're just confirming that it's gone. Cool. His name's Andy. He's an ex-pastor. Our anxiety level dropped off. This guy had a very peaceful look to his face, very peaceful tone to his voice. And we're just like, you know, starting to feel a little bit better. And he said, have you gotten your pocket angel yet? I said, no, I don't know what that is. And with that, he reached in his pocket, and he handed me this great pocket angel right here. Nothing more than a coin with an angel on it. And he said, here, take this, add this to your arsenal of things, faith, hope, family, friends. It got me through my cancer. Maybe this will help you get through your cancer. Wow, you know, thank you very much, appreciate it. I asked him a question. What's with the bells? He goes, oh yeah, 
when the nurse called me to schedule my first appointment at Stanford, he said, okay, Andy, we'll see you at 2 o'clock on Tuesday. He said, great, I'll be there with bells on. <laughs> so for every appointment he went to Stanford University, he wore the bells around his wrist. Well, that's a great story. Okay. It was about that time I got called in to go get my chest x-ray, so I step out. Andy and Susan continue to talk. He hands her a business card. He says, here, in case you guys ever need to talk about Stanford or life or what you're going through right now, feel free to give me a call. Be willing to talk to you, you know, anytime. So about that time I come back out, I'm all done. We say our goodbyes and our thank yous. And we leave. And it's about a, you know, a day or two later, I asked Susan, I said, where's Andy's business card? I want to put it in my palm pocket, PBA. <laughs> <laughs> so she looks in her medical binder. It's not in there. Oh, it must be in her jeans pocket. So she goes and looks through her jeans that she had on there. Can't find it. She tears the place apart. Can't find the guy's business card. Don't worry. We got it. We got the end. The best. All we have to do is next time we're at Stanford, we'll go to the different areas and say we're trying to get a message to Andy, you know, the guy with the bells on his wrist. So the next time we're there, we go to radiology. We're trying to get a message to this guy, Andy, you know, the guy with the bells on his wrist. I don't know what we're talking about. That's okay. Well, there's other areas. So we go to infusion. We're trying to get a message to Andy, you know, the guy with the bells around his wrist, swarmed to every appointment. We get another fine look. So we go to oncology. Trying to get a message to Andy, you know, the guy with the bells around his wrist, swarmed to every single appointment. We know he was in oncology. That's where he got that pocket. <coughs> That's what he told us. <coughs> and they look at us like we're nuts. And that's when it hit us. Andy was my guardian angel. Andy came to let us know that they got it. It's okay. It's handled. Don't worry about it. I left that experience knowing that no matter what happens to me, whether Andy and my creator say, I got a little bit more time here, or they say, you know what, we need you upstairs. I was going to be okay with that. Now, my family and friends might not be so good with that. But it didn't matter. No matter the outcome, it's all good. So we tell this story to family and friends. And I'm telling one of my good friend's mothers what happened. She goes, yeah, remember the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. I ball. Just like it couldn't take it. Just cracked my eyes out. Why didn't I see that? So, it, it's so hard to talk about. This man helped us, got us through this, made me feel like. It doesn't matter what's going to happen, whether I'm here or not. It's, it's okay. It's April 1st, 2013. I'm 45 years old. I've been married for 11 years. We have two wonderful boys, of which I had a 5% chance of having kids after treatment. 5%. <clears throat> To this day, I've not heard again, Chuck, you've got cancer. But that's not what's important here. What's important is the next time you're sitting down somewhere, a perfectly good stranger comes in and sits down next to you and strikes up a conversation, you're going to ask yourself, is that my guardian angel? I'm close to
contest Toastmaster, we have collected the ballots. Okay, so here's the story. Funny thing about libraries that close at 9 o'clock. So you're going to have to listen fast, and this is going to be the fastest round of interviews you've ever seen in your life. We're going to hope they're air fast, because if not, they're going to be pushing us out the door, folks. Any questions at all? Okay, good. Seeing them here tonight. We are going to have each contestant come up. You guys need to listen, because these are directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So here's your direction. You're going to give your name, the club that you're representing, and your education level in postmasters. And then we're all going to give a big rousing. And we're going to go to the next person. Does the audience have their instructions? Yes. Yes. Do the contestants have their instructions? Yes. Let's just practice one time. Okay. First contestant. Hello, you're Anissa Wari, Toastmasters of Lincoln Park, DCM. Excuse me, hold on. The, the, the directions for the audience go for you, too. Okay. Sabir Ahmad, uh, club number 665, Niles Township, and uh, CC. Tigers Quayna, talk of the Glen and its third season. The Tiger Schwal, the Tulsa View Well Club, one four seven eight three seven nine ALB ACB. Hi, Kevin Henderson, eighteen fifty six figures of speech ACB. <laughs> John Sarah Palace, North Suburban Toastmasters Club six twelve, and I then eight speeches to my CC. Ron I. Pulser, Unity Toastmasters, ACB and CL. <laughs> Rebecca James, Abbott Toastmasters 2679. Currently no education level, but triple crown by Spring Conference. <laughs> Chuck Gerhardt, Underwriters Laboratories, Club Toast at UL, CC. Deb Martin, speaking of success, DTM. Rez Vasilev, Toastmasters of Lincoln Park, ACB. Okay, give us a round of applause. I'm not sure how fast they can add, but I am pretty sure of how fast I can talk. So what I would like is to have all of the dignitaries and all of our area governors from Northeast and the North Divisions please join me on stage because we are going to... I'm sorry, see, they change the directions even when I'm in a rush. Northeast and district dignitaries. We're going district dignitaries in Northeast. Please come up to the stage. See, we said we were in a hurry, and I know Donna has new circle, so everybody else has to move quickly. Where is everybody? Oh, they're all They're all ahead. Okay. I will now turn it over to our esteemed Northeast Division Governor, Jane Sanchez. Uh-huh. 
International Speech Contest. Drum roll. Final names. Rebecca James.